Hello and welcome, this is part 3 of this series. Please like and subscribe to my channel so I can continue to do this type of content, also I would like to tell you that I do not plan on enabling advertisements in the near future. I do this because it's something I enjoy. You could get it tattooed. Nami smiled at Valerie, unzipping her coat and shrugging up her sleeve to show the blonde, see? It's covering a scar here too. She quickly zipped back up, shivering. Hiahaha. <laughs> Val couldn't help but laugh, it's not a bad idea. Not a clue what I would tattoo it with though. She grinned, besides, with Chopper's medicine, it apparently isn't even going to scar as badly as the SE 20 thought it would. She grinned and raised her glass, so thanks for that, Chopper Kun. Baka. Chopper channeled his inner Sanji and started to noodle around, praising me what make me happy, you know. Robin smiled in amusement, you look plenty happy to me. She took a sip of her drink as well. Shishishishi. Luffy laughed, dropping in and wrapping an arm around Robin and BV, glad to see you two doing better. You too Val. BV flushed at the contact and looked away, while Robin merely enjoyed the contact. How long had it been since she genuinely felt she could trust someone? Decades. She leaned in a little unconsciously, noticing Nami aimed them with a glint in her eye that she couldn't quite put a finger on. Oh yes, after the past few days, I feel positively marvelous. For more reason than one. The conversation with BV had her feeling lighter than she had in years. And now that she was getting affection and not having to worry about a knife in the back, perhaps even a little touch starved. Thank you Luffy. VV smiled up at him from the side, for everything. Shishishi. What are you thanking me for? It's what any of us would have done for each other. Luffy replied, pulling them both in for tighter hugs. Robin hissed, and he rapidly let go, looking at her in concern, still sensitive. She answered his unasked question, but I'm okay. Just caught me by surprise. If you're sure. Luffy said, lingering on her in concern, before moving on, anyway. It's party time. We have a new crew member. He crowed, getting cheers from the rest of the crew. Do. Robin said, raising her own glass. Eh? Luffy asked in shock, did we pick up someone else while I wasn't looking? Robin giggled, I don't know what I expected. Never mind. She knocked the drink back, to Chopper, our little doctor. That won't make me happy, Baka. Did the weather stop changing for five minutes? BV screamed ineffectually towards the sky, shaking a fist in futile rage upwards. Conserve your strength, BV. Robin chided with some bemusement in her tone. A few more days had passed, and they were both all but back to a hundred percent. Of course, the time passing brought a new problem, that being a lack of food. Ugh Valerie moaned, didn't we pack for three weeks on drum? Nami scowled as she sat roughly with the other women on the crew, yeah, or Luffy's stomach for three days. She let out an explosive sigh, have the fish been biting at least? Nope. VV groaned, Mr. Cook has a point. We need a lock on the pantry. And the fridge and the rest of the supplies she paused, letting out a wry smile, okay, we need to Luffy-proof the ship. The rest of the ladies burst into laughter. It was interrupted by Luffy flying by and bashing into the rail, oi. Damn it, Sanji. Stop stealing food, you idiot. We're going to starve. The blonde cook roared at their captain. Valerie groused, if I have to eat hardtack again I'm gonna. Why aren't you whacking them, then? Luffy pointed at Karu, Usopp, and Chopper. All three of whom were fishing, but stiffened up at his words. Robin sighed, yes, I think a lock would be a very good idea. Drop anchor here. Robin called out. What? Nami turned around in surprise, why? This steam is harmless. One, because there are shallows here from the forming island, just as you said, Nami. Robin replied, two, because we are close to Alabasta now. It won't be long at all. Which means we should plan the assault on Baroque works. She waited for a reply and tilted her head slightly when no one responded. Point in fact, they stared at her dumbly. She sweat dropped slightly, you all weren't planning on going in half-cocked, were you? The five original crew members from the East Blue, Kinda looked at each other helplessly, Kinda, yeah. Robin felt a sweat drop form on her head, and BV outright face planted into the deck, I'm going to get grey hairs before I'm twenty. The princess whined, gathering herself. The crew set about doing their task, and Robin went up to her pet turtle, Banshee, be a deer, and see if you can't find us some good fish. If I have another day of hardtack I may just go spare. The chain-smoking turtle snorted smoke out before diving. She rejoined the crew, VV she glanced at the princess, the floor is yours. Right. VV sighed, first, let me explain Baroque work structure so you have an idea of what's coming. As you know, Crocodile is at the head and Robin was his right hand as Miss All Sunday. Nami snickered, still a dumb name. No arguments here. Robin giggled with her, continue. Right. VV huffed, the first thing you should know is the most dangerous thing of all. Crocodile is a villain with great publicity. 
He markets himself as Alabasta's hero and savior, all the while plotting to bring the country to its knees. She clenched a fist, every time pirates attack, he deals with it himself. DCH. Sanji lit up a cigarette, so if we just go in and kick his ass, we'll look like the bad guys, huh? That's not a problem. Luffy said without a care, we're pirates, not heroes. Heroes share their meat with others, so I don't want to be one anyway. Nami Dope slapped him along with Valerie after they all stared at him blankly for a good five seconds. While well, Luffy is being an idiot, he has a point. Usopp shrugged, it's not like we're expecting cheering, so that's not a problem for us. As long as you know, we're happy, right? Yeah. DV smiled, regardless, here is how Baroque works is structured. One male, one female. There are five officer agents along with Mr. Zero and formerly Miss All Sunday. And yes, most of the names are as bad as my own. Robin chimed in with a languid smile. Won't argue with you there Robin. Valerie replied with a giggle, except for mine, of course. Kayahaha. She twirled her parasol, those six pairs, from Mr. Zero to Mr. Five and their partners make up the leadership team of Baroque Works. We were the officer agents. Below us were the frontier agents like VV and Igarum, making up the Mr. Six to Mr. Twelve pairs. Then are the billions. The frontier agents are technically their superiors, but officer agent orders supersede theirs. There are 200 of them. And below them are the millions, who were the frontier agents' underlings. All 1800 of them. VV sighed. Han and father. Zoro grunted, you've seen what we can do, and you've gotten a hint of what Luffy can do. They won't be a problem. I'm not worried about them in combat. VV smiled, you're right, after all. After all of your training, I doubt even I would have trouble with them. She clapped a hand on her bicep, smiling cheekily. The other crew members cheered at her, and she giggled, before focusing up, but that's not what I'm worried about. I'm worried about getting there in the first place. They have dozens of ships and the crew to man them. They could simply form a blockade. Then I'll cut them. Zoro smiled viciously. I'll melt them. Luffy punched his fists together, also grinning. I have a cannon and I'm not afraid to use it. Usopp crossed his arm in his brave pose. The heavy sweating kinda ruined it though. Nami Fasipumd, I used to be a nice normal girl who just did some honest work. Not a single person there believed a word out of her mouth. Her head hung, and she held up a limp fist, I'll throw a cyclone at them. She mumbled, getting a cheer and a hug from Luffy. BV and Robin glanced at each other and traded equally suffering sighs, I suppose with this crew, the worry is rather unfounded. Her gaze sharpened, but you should not underestimate our enemies regardless. Even I don't know how Crocodile will react to my betrayal, and he has the means with which to utterly ruin Alabasta if he so chose. Further, I have no idea if he has replaced me in name or acquired other weapons, now that there is a possible leak in his eyes. She uncrossed and recrossed her legs, getting Sanji to hard eyes at her, which she ignored, here is what I do know. Firstly, I discovered he was acquiring some materials behind my back. Since I trusted him as much as I trusted a deadly snake not to bite me, I used my abilities to spy on him. The shipments were all separated, but they were easy enough to pin down. The materials he was acquiring could build a bomb large enough to level the entire capital. What? VV's shriek as she surged to her feet nearly deafened them. Robin nodded grimly, and I rather doubt any of us could live through an explosion of that magnitude. Not if we were in the blast radius. VV interrupted her, then it's even more imperative that we get there fast and put a stop to the war as quickly as possible. She soldiered on, Baroque Works has been fermenting unrest for years now, starting with the dance powder shipments that they staged in the capital. That damn material caused all of the problems, giving Alubarna all the rain it ever needed, but subsequently putting the rest of the country into a heavy drought. Rivers dried up and crops shriveled and died. She bit her lip due to her stress, that was where it all started. Rebels started cropping up, and my peaceful country turned on itself in a matter of months. However, we're in luck. We know who the real enemy is, and the rebel army is led by an old friend. She trailed off, looking down, we were all but siblings growing up. I need to meet with him at Yuba. If I can just get in front of him and speak with him, we can end this before it. She was interrupted by something she hadn't expected at all. A noise from an unexpected source. A choking noise of sheer disbelief mixed with a snort of derision. Stop this before. You cannot be serious, Nefertari VV. Robin stood, glaring at the younger girl. Robin. VV looked at her wide-eyed, before minutely shaking her head, of course I am. It's what I joined this damn organization for. She turned to the darker-haired woman, Kamza knows me. He trusts me. I'll be able to get him to listen and we can end this before it turns into a bloodbath. I don't believe what I'm hearing. Robin was legitimately in disbelief, you were a member of Baroque Works. You know how ruthless and cutthroat the organization is. You cannot be this naive. This isn't going to end without violence. H. Hey Robin. 
The atmosphere had gotten tense, and Nami tried to defuse it, you have to understand VV. She cares about her pee. Luffy exhaled, interrupting his lover, no, Robin is right. VV stiffened, turning around to stare at him with her lip quivering, we're up against one of the Shichibikai, and a million people are itching to fight. He looked directly at VV, even if you convince this Kumza guy, there's no guarantee that it'll convince the ones who don't know you. People are going to get hurt, and people are going to die before this is over. He said gently, but firmly. VV clenched her fists, what's so wrong, she clenched them so hard they started to tremble, with wanting to stop Baroque works from having their way with my country. With not wanting my people to die in a senseless war. Because it's not realistic, you silly girl. Robin spat, whirling VV around and glaring at her. VV glared back, shrugging Robin's hands off her arms, I forgave you. I offered you friendship even after everything. And now you just throw it back in my face, she screamed at the older woman, all but diving at her and trying to slug her. Yes, you did. Robin snarled back, which is why I'm not about to let the only friends I've made in 20 years row their lives away on a fool's errand. That almost knocked the fight out of VV, and the rest of the crew sucked in gasps of air at the new revelation from their most enigmatic, B bud. Robin sighed, letting go of VV and slumping back, allow me to break down your plan before you get yourself killed. First, Robin stated coldly, you haven't been in Alabasta in three years and seldom got any news due to your communications blackout. A necessity to keep your cover, but limiting in other ways. I meanwhile, had been there less than two months ago, so allow me to explain why your plan would have failed at the first hurdle. The rebel army left Yuba over six months ago because Sir Crocodile has been pounding it with sandstorms. He's been what the fight was right back in VV that she looked down at her shaking fists, that monster. She took a deep breath and exhaled. She repeated it two more times before she glared at Robin, where? Victoria. Robin replied, glancing at her nails, so allow me to explain the second reason you will fail if you continue on this foolhardy plan. Let's say a miracle happens and you succeed. You get a letter out to your father and manage to speak face to face with Kumza, and both of them believe every word coming out of your mouth. You all work hard to defuse the anger of the soldiers on both sides, and you're even starting to succeed. VV almost smiled at the very thought before Robin brought her crashing down, and then one of the hundreds of millions planted in both camps start shooting and inciting violence again. VV choked at the knowledge being presented, how would you help your country with a bullet in your chest, Nefertari VV? In Kumza's. In your father's. That's VV was almost biting through her bottom lip in her rage and anguish, that's not fair. She snarled through her teeth. Fair Valerie was the one who spoke up this time, before shaking her head, Robin is right, VV that is way too naive. If life were fair, none of us would be in this situation in the first place. She stood and now the three women were standing in a triangle, sorry to steal your thunder Robin. She glanced at her former superior and now current friend. By all means. Robin stepped back, holding out her hand and waving Valerie at VV. Valerie sighed and stared hard at VV, and the third and most important reason why stopping this is impossible can be summed up with one name. Mr. Two. Mr. Two. VV blinked owlishly, the ditzy Akama guy. Who dances like a ballerina and wears makeup. Love swans. That guy. Sanji had a very disgusted look on his face at the description. Yes, and I hardly think you have a leg to stand on calling anyone a ditz. Valerie replied dryly, not laughing for once. VV flushed and glared back. Valerie snapped her parasol closed and leaned on it like a king mister. Two. Akka, the eater of the clone clone fruit, which gives him the nifty little ability to impersonate literally anyone. VV lost every bit of color in her face, how exactly do you plan on convincing people your father isn't to blame when Baroque works can literally use his damned face to burn down an orphanage or commit any other parodically evil deeds in his name? VV slumped, every bit of fight leaving her. She couldn't hold back the tears anymore, and in the silence that filled the ship, her sniffles may as well have been gunshots. Her shoulders trembled, I just wanted to save them. I wanted to save my people from a war they didn't need. Robin let out a sigh and stepped forward. She pulled the younger girl into a hug, and the blue net started to sob in earnest into her chest, clutching the older woman like a lifeline, and you will. She said quietly, rubbing comforting circles into her back. Yes, definitely a little touch starved, but you can't save all of them. Your enemy isn't your people. Your enemy is Baroque works. The only way you can end this is if you take them down. They're the ones inciting violence. They're the ones causing riots. They're the ones planting evidence of treachery on both sides. You could get every single rebel and every single loyalist to listen to your voice and it wouldn't matter. They can't take Crocodile down, and do you really think he would just waste all of the years he's put into this? No, he would just destroy your country and raise it down into the sands themselves. VV let out a shuddering breath, then what do we do? 
the only thing we can. Valerie said, parasol closed on her shoulder, cut off the head of the snake. Burn the body. And once the deed is done, then we can worry about calming your people down. Robin finished. For the first time, Luffy stood and walked over, putting a hand on Vivi's shoulder. She turned away from Robin to look at him, you were hoping to handle this on your own. You were hoping to just come back with all the answers. But that's not going to work. You can't do it all by yourself. We're here, Vivi. We're your friends. Let us fight with you. She flung herself at him and buried her face into his chest next. He hugged her tight and started to gently run his finger on her scalp, something she found she really liked, the truth is, you want to take the croc bastard down more than anyone, don't you? She nodded into his chest, even as she continued to sob. When she pulled away, Vivi took a deep, shuddering breath, thank you she steeled herself, before turning to Robin, Robin. Robin needed no more words from the princess. With a smile on her face, she began to speak. Hey Nami. Vivi smiled at the woman who was rapidly becoming one of her closest friends. What's up? You wanted to speak in private. I did. Nami smiled back, before we hit Alabasta and get mired down anyway. Vivi's smile dimmed, is everything okay? Nami sat on the bed and stared up at the princess, I was just wondering when you started getting a crush on Luffy. W what? Vivi's face flamed red, I I don't have a crush on Luffy. Nami gave her such an unimpressed look that Vivi could only barely hold back the wince. And no, really. Vivi waved her hands no in panic, I don't. I never said anything about how chiseled his abs were. Eep. I mean, it's not like I ever called him my knight in shining armor or anything. Nami opened her mouth, and then it clicked shut in bemused disbelief. The brunette started to panic, sweating heavily, no. No. I mean it Nami. It's not like I felt so warm and safe while he was bringing me up Bighorn or wanted to snuggle with, her traitorous mouth clicked shut, and she clapped her hands over her face. Nami let out the quietest snort she possibly could, before schooling her features again. Oh, who am I kidding? She said miserably, dragging her hands down her face, I she mumbled, I really do like him. He's just so strong and brave and amazing. She moaned, before shaking her head. She was going to say something else, but Nami interrupted. I know. She was smiling again, he's hard not to fall in love with, isn't he? A love. Vivi squeaked at the word, I I don't know about love. She protested, and then slumped, not like it even matters. She said, with just the tiniest hint of bitterness, I'm not a homewrecker Nami. I would never get between the two of you. I know you wouldn't. Nami got up and hugged her, whispering in her ear. Vivi trembled minutely, T then why even set this up? She whispered in response. She found a finger under her chin, tilting her head up. She flushed, realizing how close they were, and Nami. I'm greedy. You know this. Nami smirked. Her voice was very throaty, and Vivi felt a shudder run down her spine, sometimes I like to have my cake and eat it too. WWH VV started to stammer and just didn't start babbling. So, I can't help but notice, you still haven't answered my question. She caressed Vivi's neck, drawing a small moan that Vivi couldn't stop. Do you question? Vivi licked her lips. Her throat felt incredibly dry all of a sudden. She realized what she was asking, th the care he showed us every step of the way when we were sick. Th that was when I think I realized. I thought so. Nami smiled in victory, though him being such a snack helped, I'm sure. Vivi's blush had been dying down, but it flamed back to full force, Nami. Vivi whined deep in her throat. There's something you have to remember, Vivi Nami pulled her close, to the point their breasts were squishing up against each other. Vivi was almost about to pass out, we're pirates Nami whispered into her ear, and we laugh at right and proper. She heard thumping, which made Vivi panic and try to leave her embrace, but Nami held fast and instead whirled her around, presenting her to the door. She pressed up against the younger girl, putting as much contact between their bodies as possible. One hand wrapped around her waist, and the other just ghosted under her right breast. Before Vivi could let out a word of protest, the door opened and Luffy strolled in with a big grin, hey Nami, what did you want he stopped, staring at their compromising position. He tilted his head to the side, what are you two doing? He asked in confusion. Nami smiled, well, she stuck her tongue out playfully while VV stared at the floor in panic, VV here had something she wanted to tell you, but needed a little push. Oh? Why didn't you say so? Luffy asked cluelessly, shutting the door behind him and walking forward. What's up, VV? VV was panicking. Was Nami really doing this? Was she really okay with this? L Luffy I, she couldn't get the words out. What's wrong? Are you okay? He got closer, you can tell me anything, you know. That's R-I-G-H-T Nami cooed into the teen's ear, go on VV. Tell him. She placed a gentle kiss on VV's neck, just below her ear. Luffy's eyes widened minutely at the sight. VV shivered as something seemed to snap. 
Her hands reached out and grabbed Luffy by the back of his neck, pulling him closer as she stood on her tiptoes to kiss him. Behind her, Nami grinned, sitting back down and watching with smoldering eyes. She leaned back, both arms behind her propping her up. Luffy's eyes were open in shock, and he glanced at her. Nami nodded, and Luffy wrapped his arms around Vivi and quickly took command of the kiss. Vivi moaned into his mouth, one hand pulling on his neck and the other on his back. Unbidden, her right leg rose and wrapped around him slightly as well. Vivi squeaked as Luffy's hands dropped lower and squeezed both of her pert cheeks, raising her up into the air. The princess moaned deep again as she wrapped her legs around his waist, her other arm going around his neck as she pulled away, El Luffy I she panted. Her whole body felt like it was on fire. I like you. I really, really like you. She breathed out, before claiming his lips feverishly once more before he could respond, opening her mouth and moaning as he dominated her tongue. Luffy strode forward, getting on his knees and shuffling onto the bed holding the princess in his arms. Nami held her arms out and embraced the princess as she was dropped on her lap, and we really like you, Vivi. She nibbled on the princess's earlobe, reaching up and gently squeezing the younger girl's breasts. Nami. Vivi squeaked as she broke the kiss. She inclined herself and turned back to look at the mikan haired woman, I. Nami grasped her chin gently, I really like you too, Vivi. She leaned down just as Vivi leaned up. Luffy all but breathed out steam from his nose in a huff as he watched the two utterly gorgeous women under him make out. He leaned down and started to suckle on Vivi's exposed earlobe, feathering kisses down her neck as he pulled her collar down slightly. Vivi let out another moan as he left a love bite on her skin where it would be unseen, hidden by her shirt, unless it was really low cut. The two continued their ministrations, driving Vivi wild as they swapped kisses and love bites equally. Then, Nami reached down and ghosted a touch between Vivi's legs, and the princess started. She reached down and grabbed Nami's hand, pulling away from Luffy and stammering, I I don't know I if I'm ready F for that yet. Nami immediately pulled her hand away, sorry. She apologized sincerely, smooching VV on the cheek, before VV reached behind her and forced another kiss from her. It's okay. VV breathed, I'm not mad. She smiled reassuringly, I I don't know if I'm ready for that. She repeated, before her face slowly turned red. She squeaked, B but maybe I could watch. Luffy and Nami smirked, and VV fell in love all over again. Guad. Luffy roared gleefully, staring at the giant animal behind their ship. Beside him, Zoro was also slavering while in his Santbrick stance, our first meal in four days. Oh no it isn't. VV bonked the both of them on the head, appearing in a pretty decent Zoro. Ow. What gives, VV? Luffy turned and glared at her angrily, before his stomach growled and he slumped, folding over the rail, and almost falling off Mary. So hungry. You can't eat it. Not that one. VV sighed, sorry, I should have warned you ahead of time. The sea cat is a sacred animal in Alabasta, so if you killed one you'd be committing blasphemy. She glared at Sanji, who she had seen racing to the stern of the ship as well when the sea cat had appeared. The blonde meekly backed away. Luffy cried pitifully, chewing on the wooden rail as he slumped back onto the deck. Our lunch. I just said no. Vivi roared angrily, before palming her forehead, besides, you'll have plenty to eat soon. Seeing one of those sea cats means only one thing. Alabasta is close. Uh, guys. Usopp called from the crow's nest, we have problems. He jumped down, a rope slowing his fall as he landed neatly, we have Baroque work ships up ahead. His knees clattered together in fear. What? Vivi gasped, and she cursed when they were apparently sighted because the ship started coming towards them. Have they? It's a blockade. Robin said simply, frowning, I know we talked about the possibility, but Crocodile must really be feeling the frustration. This kind of thing isn't usually in his playbook. The fact Mr. 3 was defeated on drum, and he still has no idea where I am. He's trying to keep us from Alabasta by any means necessary. Nami concluded, before smirking at Luffy, what do we have to say about that? Luffy smirked roguishly, making Vivi's heart skip a beat, let them try. Minutes passed and now the ships were within range of any forward cannons, of which Luffy could spot three that seemed to have them, along with Mary of course. Sanji, Usopp. He said simply. Right. The two responded. Robin spun the wheel from afar, turning the ship slightly, just as flashes burst into existence on the enemy ships. Usopp moved quickly, aiming, and firing their two free cannons as fast as he could. As he did so, Robin quickly used her powers to reload the cannon on her own, which Usopp quickly realigned when he ran back to it and fired once more. All three of their shots hit most of the enemy shots, blowing the cannonballs to pieces far away from anything valuable. The one that got through was racing for the main mast. Sanji grinned as he jumped into the air, catching the iron ball with his foot and spinning, launching it right back at the enemy ship in an impressive show of strength. 
The man on the enemy vessel started to panic as the return to sender smashed through their forward-facing cannon and destroyed it in a shower of metal and wood. Below the deck, Val fired their own forward-facing cannon with a cheery laugh. She wasn't nearly the shot Usopp was, so she didn't take out an enemy in one shot, but her shot still managed to catch the ship just above the water line. Immediately the vessel started taking water and getting heavier on one side, meaning it started to list out of its trajectory. Kayahaha. She laughed as the enemy ship unwillingly rammed another of the Baroque Works vessels. Her job done, she raced back up to the main deck. The job Val. Luffy cheered, drawing another laugh from her, ready. She plopped her butt down onto his hand, as I'll ever be. She pointed towards one of the ships right after sliding another pair of Usopp's goggles onto her eyes, pull. But nary a grunt, Luffy tossed her high into the air, flinging her towards the enemy ship. Kaihahaha. I love this crew. She screamed in delight as she soared through the air. She was as light as a feather, and that meant that she could utilize some very miniature gap miss she needed to. She definitely couldn't get even a whisper at full weight. She just hadn't been training long enough yet. And seeing as the enemies were shooting at her. Her adrenaline and heart were pumping as she dodged bullet after bullet that the panicking billions were firing at her. Right up until she was directly over the enemy ship. But the slasher smile on her face, she changed to max weight in a blink of an eye, 10,000 kilo press. She cried out, plummeting from the sky like a meteor. She did her best to brace herself with tech eye, but like Gepma it wasn't one she was good at yet. She impacted the main mast dead center, and the ship buckled. The mast cracked, all but splitting down the middle. The ship itself gave out a tortured groan as wood started to crack and splinter before it split in half widthwise like an accordion. The impact had also brought the ship down a good few feet, meaning when the ship started to split, water rushed in with all of the sea's fury. The ship and men below her didn't stand a chance, being claimed by the sea and sent down to Davy Jones. As the mast also started to sink, she leapt back into the air and started groaning as she kicked her way back to the Mary. The second she landed, she collapsed, how do you do it? She cried, massaging her screaming thighs and calves. I weighed one kilo and I barely made it back. The fact you can get it at all irks me. Nami growled, it took that damn avalanche for me to get it and that was after months of hard training to get me to that point. Hi ha ha. She moaned, unable to even keep laughing. Who's next? Robin smiled nastily, me. She crossed her arms, Sion Fleur. She chanted, and on the closest enemy ship arm started popping out, guided by eyes sprouted on the mast, clutch. Groans and snaps sounded from the enemy ship as the billions on it were all treated to a full course of joint locks. They cried out in agony as everything from their limbs to their spines were snapped like twigs, as Robin forced their bodies to bend in ways they weren't meant to. But that wasn't all she did. To make sure they wouldn't escape or be able to announce to Crocodile that she was alive on their terms, she dropped the anchor on the starboard side. She also threw the wheel, spinning it in the proper direction for the wind to catch in the worst way possible. Below the deck, she unhooked everything she could, leaving the heavy items free to slide. The side of the ship that had dropped anchor violently jerked down into the water as the anchor caught and the stern lifted straight out of the water. The ship club hauled violently and everything went according to plan. The ship never righted itself due to the heavy weights flying towards one side, and the ship capsized with a mighty splash. It didn't take long at all to sink. BV and several other crew members were shivering as if a cold wind was blowing on them, I'm so glad you're on our side. Bufufufu. Robin laughed, uncrossing her arms, I have no idea what you mean. Look alive. Zoro called out, drawing Wad Michimanji, Kitetsu and Yubashiri, we're in their sights. The cannonade was approaching from both ends, and he and Nami were up. Tatsumaki. He roared, spinning his body and blades, creating a twister before the ship's starboard side. On the port side, Nami formed an X with two of the halves of her cleam attacked, before tossing them, Cyclone Tempo. She cried, forming her own cyclone on the port side. The heavy winds on both sides of the ship caught all of the approaching cannon fire. While Zoro's also had a cutting component to them, Nami's did not. Zoro's cannonballs were diced in half, falling harmlessly to the ocean below. He sheathed Yubashiri and Kitetsu, keeping Wadm in hand. He closed his eyes and took a deep breath, trying to capture the feeling from before on drum. He didn't wish for a second that they had kept Golden Week with them, instead of leaving her with Dalton and Kariha. If he couldn't do it on his own, then it was worth nothing. The world fell away, and a momentary glimmer weakly engulfed Wadden. His eyes snapped open as he raised his treasured blade above his head, Yakandori. The crescent moon-shaped blade of wind erupted from Wadden, racing towards the panicking billion's ship and cutting it clean in half. Zoro grinned widely as he saw the proof of how far he'd come. Now I just need to get faster at that. On the other side, Nami jumped forward off the ship as her cyclone tempo ended. The cannonballs which had been bunched up and rising towards the sky, started to fall as the winds died down. 
She caught the two pieces of her clean attacked with a grin and rearranged them. Tornado tempo. Two little clockwork doves popped out of her weapon and started to spin, disgorging cool and heat balls alike. This was a technique she had needed to get together with Usopp to fix, and the result had been well worth the added cost. A sideways cyclone appeared before her this time, catching the falling cannonballs and directing them right towards the enemy ship. The torrent of wind and metal crashed into it, shredding the enemy vessel, putting a myriad of holes into it. The force of the attack launching knocked Nami back, and she used the momentum to backflip back onto the Mary. Oh yes, I'm the scary one. Robin quipped, her tone entirely too amused. Shushushi. Three left. He leapt into the air, they're mine. Instead of using Gepm, his feet ignited in plasma, sending him flying towards the enemy ships, woo. He cheered, his left hand skimming the ocean waves before he rose slightly and pulverized the keel of the ship as he burst through and into the craft. From outside, all that the onlookers could see was two beams of plasma erupting from the ship and spinning one and a half times from the inside. Then, the beams petered out and the blackened hull was clearly separated into two pieces. And then everything above that deck rose into the air, with a jet of plasma shooting down through the bottom of the keel and into the ocean, boiling it. Luffy carried the entire middle and upper decks of the enemy ship above his head, the panicking billions trying desperately to keep their balance. And then Luffy threw the entire thing at another ship. The mast pierced through the ship and the vessel rocked from the impact. Water started to rush in as the ship tilted from the extra weight they couldn't possibly get rid of, and the second capsizing of the day occurred. Luffy held his hand out towards the last Baroque work ship, and a ball of plasma appeared in front of him, Enten Enten no Kmen. He roared, launching the ball forwards. It pierced the ship as if the wood weren't even there, leaving nothing more than a tiny, blackened hull. And then a star was born, throwing waves in every direction and blinding any onlookers. When the light was gone, so was about 60% of the enemy ship. The rest looked charred at the edges of the spherical cutout, and both halves of it were separated from each other. The stern did a nosedive and sank, while the bow continued moving forward, before its momentum ran out and it started to sink with nothing more than burbling from the superheating water around it. Luffy turned and raced back towards his ship, cutting off the jets and flipping back onto the deck triumphantly. Shishishi. No, really, Robin said, a light bit of sweat on her brow, I'm the scary one. Shishishishi. One of the customers dropped dead. Toshigi told her superior as they stared at the growing crowd before the quaint little eatery. From what I heard, they think the poor guy ate something called a desert strawberry. She adjusted her glasses, it's actually a spider that looks incredibly like a real strawberry. If you eat it, it bites and envenomates your stomach and kills you a few days later. That showcases the danger that having no information presence, doesn't it? Smoker sighed, huffing out a bit of smoke. Toshigi wisely kept her mouth shut, knowing he wasn't just talking about the dead man. Smoker really hated this desert heat. His arm still hadn't healed over from Straw Hat's attack and was wrapped in bandages under his coat. It was still incredibly sensitive to heat, so this climate wasn't particularly good. So, the guy just dropped dead in the middle of dinner and everyone is crowding around him. Why haven't they moved him to the morgue? They can't. She replied as they continued walking forward, apparently this spider is a dastardly devil. Once dead, the venom spreads throughout the body, which becomes contagious and stays that way for several hours. She bit her lip, anyone who tries to touch him will suffer the same fate. Why? Captain. One of the marines with him was charging in their direction, see Captain Smoker. He yelled, putting his hands on his knees and panting. You do the world no good dead, son. Catch your breath and tell me what happened. Smoker stared at him with serious eyes. The man took a deep breath before looking his superior in the eye, sir, you're not going to believe this. Poor devil. One of the bystanders had his hand up in prayer, his body just froze in the position he died in. He's even clutching his fork. What a way to go another replied sadly, it really kills you that quai. Wubba. The shirtless man sat up, scaring the souls out of several of the other patrons, food dribbling from his face. He looked around blearily, eyes landing on the woman closest to him. Yes sir? She asked hesitantly, are you Akia? She screamed, pressing down on the front of her dress as he pulled it up and just wiped his damn face with her apron. Thankfully for her heart, he quickly let go of it. Huh, would I know he deadpanned, face still looking tired, I fell asleep. While talking, the rest of them cried out, with food in your mouth. The proprietor laughed, well, thank goodness you're okay, sir. We thought you ate a deadly desert strawberry and died. Nah, I know to look out for though the man fell asleep again, a snot bubble rising in front of his nose this time as he leaned back. Finish your sentences. The crowd roared. So, he's not dead. Toshigi snorted, it really was too good to be true. Right, Smoker said, glancing at her, go and gather the men for a cordon around the area. Start evacuating. Sir. Toshigi saluted and ran off. 
The chain smoker barged into the restaurant, so, it really is you. The door clattered on the wall, making most everyone in there flinch and quiet down. You've got a lot of nerve, don't you, Pork is the ace. Ace turned around, staring at him with an unimpressed eyebrow, what's Whitebeard 2nd Division Commander doing here in Alabasta? The atmosphere in the restaurant became frigid as the townspeople started to panic. They had been yelling at him. Ace shrugged, who knows. He smirked, was in the area. Decided to drop in and enjoy the sights. Food ain't been bad either. Smoker clenched his fists, you expect me to believe that load. Believe what you want. A said, putting a toothpick in his mouth and smirking at the marine. I'm not here to cause trouble. Truth be told, I stopped here since apparently my kid brother is going to stop here. Haven't seen him in a few years, you see. He leaned back, so why don't you be a smart little marine and back off? Or sit down and grab a pint. He raised his glass with a bit of a mocking smirk on his face. Smoker's glare doubled, I think not. I may not be here for your head, but as long as I'm a marine and you're a pirate, then I'll have to smoke started leaving his jacket as he prepared to fight. The ad ace kept that same cocky expression on his face, get into a fight in a crowded restaurant in the middle of the day. He asked, look around you, my good captain. Are you just another one of the Kanu's goons who thinks wearing a uniform makes you just? Will you hurt these people just to annoy me? You bastard. Smoker growled, almost biting through his cigars, you would take hostages. Hardly, moron. You're the one who wants to fight a man just enjoying a good meal. Ace shot back, I don't make a habit of crushing weaklings. Or do you think that fancy little Karamsiki weapon you got will allow you to take me out? Smoker made to reply, but he never got the chance. Something grabbed his collar, and before he knew what was happening, for the second time in his life, he was moving fast enough to break the speed of sound. And everything behind him until he finally got the wherewithal to turn into smoke, move it smoky. Luffy said as he walked into the restaurant without a care, as if he hadn't just thrown the marine captain hunting him more than a mile away. I'm hungry he stopped, his eyes widening, Ace. Luffy? Ace cackled maniacally, having not expected that turn of events in the slightest. He stood, an excited grin on his face, and clasped forearms with his brother, it's been three years. He snickered, still the same old hungry idiot, huh? Luffy turned dead eyes towards him, I haven't had any good food in days. He pointed at the owner, food. A slapped the back of his head as he took his seat, manners. Makino would kill you. Ow. Luffy rubbed the back of his head, what was that for, Ace? I just told you. The older one yelled back, incensed. And then they both fell asleep, standing up. But lord, they really are brothers. One of the patrons yelled. That idiot. Nami groaned, he just had to run off, didn't he? BV giggled, well, at least we planned for it. She gave her. Girlfriend. A thumbs up. Doing so showcased the bandages on her arm, which was mirrored on every member of the crew. A precaution against Mr. Two's infiltration capabilities. He's at a restaurant. Robin giggled into her hand, poor Captain Smoker though. I haven't seen someone get tossed so negligently in years. Smoker. Nami blinked, opening and closing her mouth once, seriously. Robin looked at her in surprise. Why did that make her sound so incensed? Well, Luffy called him Smokey as he was throwing him away. Nami ground her teeth, bastard doesn't move an inch from Logetown when there were pirates fucking enslaving my people, but his pride gets crushed once and he chases us to the Grand Line. Ah, yeah that would about do it. Fuck the marines. Nami stomped off. Zor let out a sigh, alright everyone. Let's eat and then get our jobs done. Ay ha ha, going to be a bit hard if the town is crawling with marines. Val spun her parasol in amusement. BV deadpanned, also, why did we send Sanji to go get outfits for us? And why did no one talk us out of the idea before he left? Ufufufu. Robin chuckled, this should be quite entertaining. I hope he chooses something purple for me, of course. My, you outdid yourself, Sanji. Robin purred as she twirled in her costume, a bedla outfit with a very deep V cut that went down nearly to her navel, with a garment ending above her belly button as well. The skirt was flowing down to her calves and split down the right side. She wore gold bangles with blue jewels for a belt and necklace, and a darker colored veil over the bottom half of her face. And it was even in purple, just as requested. Nami let out a sigh, honestly, I don't know what else I expected. She smiled, I wonder if he realizes that this outfit is just going to make bedroom time more fun for me, and lolofy, she smirked gleefully as Sanji froze at her cruel tone. Her own outfit had more of a bikini top with waves on it, and her skirt was longer without the slit on the side. I am conflicted. Sanji started to cry, before he cheered up, Nami Swan may be gone into that bastard's clutches, but my love for VV, Valerie, and Robin shall prevail. They had not yet made the crew aware of VV's updated relationship status. 
said Princess was fascipaming to hide her blush, Sanji she said slowly, we're supposed to be hiding. What part of this outfit is incognito? These are dancer outfits. Her top was a little bit safer than Nami's, but not by much, and she wore more flowing cloth than the rest of the girls. Dancers are citizens too. Sanji replied, ignoring the other half of the question, no one would guess we're pirates and a princess like this. He loved twirled around. Ayahahaha, I wonder, VV, do you know how to work it in that? Valerie grinned foam maliciously. Her outfit was a yellow mirror of VV's, except she only had the front and back portions, leaving her legs on display. She was also covering up her right arm, since the scars would probably blow her cover as a dancer. Wouldn't you like to know? VV thought to herself in a little irritation, before she blushed, that's only for Luffy and Nami to know. The thought made her let out a little smirk. Sanji sure would be disappointed. Anyway, are we ready to move out? Zoro asked, taking a gulp of his booze. He and the rest of the guys were dressed in more regular desert clothes. Sanji did know how to pick him when he wasn't being an idiot. Yufufufu, I don't think our little reindeer will be doing any moving like that. Robin chimed in, still smirking. Eh? They all looked down, Chopper. What's wrong? Being. Chopper groaned, ineffectually holding his hooves up to his nostrils. My nose feels like it's going to fall off. Vivi gasped, oh, Tony Kun, I'm so sorry. Nanahana is famous for its perfumes. Chopper gagged, some of them are very potent. Like this. Nami teased, spritzing her neck once with a lovely lavender perfume, happy smile on her face, I'm keeping this. Please don't. Chopper cried piteously, falling on his back. Sanji predictably went into love mode and just as predictably started butting heads with Zoro when he insulted him. Usopp sighed, let's just go find Luffy so we can regroup. So then I just blasted him and we sailed off. Luffy finished the story of Logetown. Geez, it's hard to believe Buggy sailed with Shanks. Ace laughed, what an idiot. What, did he expect you to just sit there and let his first mate trap you? Who knows what that buffoon planned. Luffy shrugged as he finished his meal. Man, I'm stuffed. He dropped a jingling sack of coins on the counter. Eh, paying for our food. Who are you and what have you done with Luffy? A smirked, having been prepared to dine and dash with a little idiot just like the old days. Shishishi, I'll explain later. Luffy laughed as they stood, walking out of the building. And stopped as they stared at the company's worth of marines standing there with the literally fuming smoker in the lead. A smirked, wow, you waited for us to finish eating and leave the restaurant. You even cleared the plaza out. Not bad, Smokey. That puts you up a few notches in my book. That puts you at and then to add insult to injury, he pulled out a pencil and a scrap of paper with a hard back and started writing, add the five, carry the two he mumbled, scribbling on the paper. He even bit the pencil lightly while Luffy tried to hold in his guffaws, alright. Ace threw both over his shoulder carelessly, zero. Congrats on being neutral. You bastards are both under arrest. Smoker thundered, white launcher. He shot forward, his jit pointed at Ace's throat like a spear. White blow. Ace casually inclined his head to the side, before reaching up and grabbing Smoker's hand and stopping the weapon cold. Smoker gasped, before almost vomiting as Ace buried his knee into the captain's sternum, I asked you earlier, didn't I? Ace asked rhetorically, you didn't really think you could capture me just because you had a fancy little Kermsiki weapon, did you? He kicked Smoker away with a snort before the man could respond, you did. That's adorable. I've met some idiots, but you, my friend, take the cake at the moment. Ace. Luffy's eyes were sparkling, you figured it out. Hey? Eh? Ace turned his head before he realized what Luffy was talking about, ahahaha. Oh, you're talking about Gramps' old trick, huh? He gave his little brother a cocky smirk, what, you haven't? Tell me eh? Luffy tried to glomp him, but they were again interrupted. Capture them, men. Do not let either of them escape. Smoker roared, creating a whole hell of a lot of smoke. Honestly? A sighed, some people just don't learn. He smirked at Luffy, you go on and get out of here. I'll catch up when the heat's died down. I got a better idea. Luffy shot back, grinning equally wide, first to 50, wins. He shot forward, blurring from sight. Why you little? Ace quickly followed, vanishing in his own sorrow. Luffy kicked through Smoker's head, but this time the man was prepared, in no small part due to Luffy's shout. He dispersed and Luffy passed through him. You won't escape me this time, Straw Hat. He whirled around, but Luffy was already gone, and ten of his marines were already down for the count. Chishishi, how's the arm, Smokey? Luffy laughed, appearing in front of him, looks like it healed up nice. It'll heal up better when you're behind bars. Smoker yelled, white blow. His jit pierced through Luffy, making him almost swallow his cigar in surprise. Only he hadn't pierced Luffy at all. The straw hat wearing man faded away, as if he had never been there at all. 
And then Smoker let out a pain gasp as Ace buried his foot into his side, launching him into a building. You won't escape, Straw Hat. Toshiga yelled, her sword ready and waiting. Luffy landed in front of her, and she tensed, ready to strike. And almost fell over when Luffy glanced at her and just said, nope. WH she sputtered as he turned and went to go beat more of their men, damn it Straw Hat, fight me. Is it because I'm a woman fight me, damn it. Nope. You're Zoro's girlfriend. You'll have to wait. Luffy called back cheerfully. I girl to Shiggy reddened in apoplectic rage, you isle. Smoker barreled out of the building he'd been launched into, white grasp. A massive plume of smoke surrounded the plaza, looking to ensnare and trap the both of them. Yeah, yeah, Ace shook his head, people should know when they're in over their heads. He raised his hand, and Jomo. And then there was fire. Fire licked all around, grappling and overcoming Smoker's smoke. Fire enveloped the plaza, trapping the marines inside. He grinned, tipping his hat to Luffy, well. What do you think, little brother? Luffy stared at him, and then he pointed, ahahaha. Ace is a copycat. Why Ace sputtered, what the hell is that supposed to mean? He roared at his little brother. Luffy smirked back, mine is better. You little shit. Ace growled, you wanna go? He raised his fist angrily. Nah, let's go meet my crew. I'll kick your butt some other time. Luffy laughed, and before Ace could actually start a brawl with him, he pointed at the fire, by the way, don't burn the city down, or Vivi will kill you. Ace raised an eyebrow, just what have you gotten yourself into, Luffy? He raised his hand, and the fire closed into a dome. He waited a few seconds, before he relaxed and the fire completely vanished, being sucked back into him. All of the marines were unconscious on the ground, both from heat exhaustion and oxygen deprivation. Let's go. The only marine conscious was Smoker, and he couldn't get up as he watched the two outlaws get away, damn it. All he could do was clench a fist, I wasn't ready. I couldn't even touch him. He coughed, trying to find the energy to grab a cigar, I guess he earned that 900 million Billy bounty. Before he passed out, the only thought that ran through his mind was that Luffy had to be caught before he reached that level too. What's the hold up with Luffy? VV asked Robin, face serious. He's on the way back. She replied blithely, with a guest. It better not be the marines. Usopp groaned, getting his slingshot ready just in case. Ufufufu, not quite. Robin smiled, before turning. Hey guys. Luffy landed on the railing with a laugh, we all good to go. You took a while. What were you doing? Nami asked as she greeted her lover with a kiss. Wow, Luffy with a girl. The world weeps. Ace deadpanned, and the crew whirled around in shock. Ace was lounging on the rail on the upper deck of the Mary. He grinned, tipping his hat, how do you do? They took him in, he was taller than Luffy by just an inch, and wore shorts and just about nothing else. He had a tattoo on his upper left bicep that spelled ass vertically. He never wore a shirt anymore. Not since he became a whitebeard pirate. He was proud of the much larger tattoo of their Jolly Roger on his back. He wore a red beaded necklace and an orange hat with two blue smileys, one of which was frowning and the other smiling. His hair was messier than Luffy's, and he had freckles on his cheeks. Nami smirked, spoken like a jealous older brother. At that, Robin had a bit of a lightbulb moment, having known that there was a connection between Ace and Luffy, but not what the connection had been. Ha! Ace barked out a laugh, she has some fire in her. He jumped down, and his finger lit up in fire, which he used to light Sanji's new cigarette up. Sanji smirked at the action, I'd like to thank you all for taking care of this little idiot. He put Luffy in a headlock. Damn it, get off Ace. He elbowed his brother, who let out a playful oof. Eh, uh, more like he's been taking care of us. Usopp said, sweat dropping. Ace let out a laugh of understanding, eh, uh, it's an older brother thing. You know how it is. Anyway, what are you even doing here, Ace? Luffy asked, having not asked that question while they were catching up. Ace blinked, I thought you didn't ask because you knew. Didn't you get my message back in drum? He shook his head, well, whatever. I'm hunting a former crewmate. The atmosphere went still, the bastard committed the worst sin imaginable on a ship like ours. He killed a crewmate to steal a devil fruit he found, and then he jumped ship. Luffy growled, that bastard. His crew was equally infuriated. Yup. Ace let out a sigh, Teach was in my division, so I felt responsible. I've been chasing him ever since. He's going by Blackbeard nowadays. He shook his head, but enough about that. I wanted to invite you to join Whitebeard. He grinned, of course, your crew will be welcome too. The ripple of shock spread through the crew. It was quickly dispelled when Luffy went, nah. King can't have a captain, can he? Ace laughed loudly, ha. Huh. Good to see you haven't changed. He smirked, unfortunately, I'm aiming to make Pops the king, so you'll have to find another dream. Then I'll kick Whitebeard's ass first. Luffy shrugged, and that had Ace nearly falling over in hysterics. Ahahaha. 
Man, I remember when I thought I was tough shit too. He smirked, if you don't even know what hockey is, you won't even be able to touch pops. Hockey? Luffy asked, smiling, is that what you did against Smokey and he shuddered, what Gramps does with his fist of love. The crew deadpanned as both brothers shivered in fear. Ace shook it off and nodded, yeah, that's it alright. More to it than that, though. Wanna see? Of course. The crew replied eagerly. Alright then. Ace grinned and took out a blindfold, putting it on. Why don't you go ahead and kick my ass then, Luffy? Luffy growled and moved faster than the rest of his crew had ever seen. His pipe caused an air blast off the side of the ship from how hard he swung it. But Ace just casually dodged it. Blindfolded. Luffy clicked his teeth and then the dance began. Every swing, Ace dodged with an ease that bordered on negligence. Luffy stopped, his eyes narrowed, that's not Kami. Ace smirked as he removed the blindfold, no. No, it is not. Kenbin Shoku Haki. It allows one to sense the intent of an opponent. Essentially, you couldn't hit me despite us being about equal in speed because I knew what you were going to do before you did it. But it isn't just the intent. It's a sixth sense that allows you to sense the presence, strength, and even emotions of others. They grinned at the looks of awe on their faces. Wait. Nami gasped, wasn't Vivi doing something similar during training? She was dodging things she couldn't even see coming. Oh? Ace turned, looking at the blue-haired young woman they had all turned to stare at, Vivi huh? And Luffy mentioned you'd want to kill me if I burned too much of the town by mistake. Vivi's gaze sharpened on him, drawing a smirk, last name wouldn't happen to be Nefertari, would it? Vivi stiffened, geez, what the hell did you get mixed up in now, Luffy? You sure know how to pick him. He snorted. Gonna kick Crocodile's ass. Luffy shrugged, bastard is trying to take over Vivi's country. She went undercover. Ace whistled, brave. I like that. He grinned at her, and she blushed, now, these things that you dodge without seeing them coming why? BV scratched her chin a little nervously, I don't know. She answered, I just don't really think, I just mow ove. She dodged, a tiny little fire bullet dispersing harmlessly. The rest of the crew and the princess glared at him. Well, I'll be. Ace was entirely unconcerned with their ire, I don't think your Kenbin Shoku is awake yet, because users conscious of it can control it much better than that. But he trailed off, that was definitely something. You're still reacting, but you're reacting to something you shouldn't be able to. Which means you even have some very minor precognitive ability. He turned to Luffy, she's definitely close. To unlock it and train it, you should fight blindfolded. Learn to ignore your eyes and ears and just sense the world around you. The most important thing to remember is that every attack carries an intent. A hint that it is coming. It works better against animals because other humans can deceive you or control their emotions much better. It works best if you're cool, calm, and collected. If your emotions are out of whack it'll fail. The other guys on Pop's ship helped me learn by blindfolding me and whacking at me with a club until they couldn't hit me anymore. Write that down. Nami commanded, though she was also crying at the future agony incoming. Way ahead of you. Usopp said, a pencil and a notebook in hand. Like Nami and two of the other three girls, he was cringing. They smirked, how funny. You better catch up quick, Luffy, otherwise one of your crewmates might get stronger than you. He teased his little brother, who glowered at him while the crew chuckled. Anyway. He waved nonchalantly, the second type of hockey is called Busmshoku. He stopped waving and made a fist, which turned as black as the night, even if it appeared slightly shiny, essentially, Busmshoku is your spirit and your will made manifest. It is your belief in your own strength, wrapped around you like armor. This one has quite a few levels to it. Let me show you. His hand turned back to normal, what's your name? Usopp. The liar quaked a little at being addressed, but otherwise stood firm. You the gunner? Ace asked him, and Usopp nodded. Of sorts. Luffy calls me his sniper rather than gunner. Usopp replied, showing his new and improved reinforced slingshot. Hmm, a slingshot certainly adds versatility, but you might want to get something with a bit more power too, unless you dive deep into Busmshoku. Ace said a little absently, let me see it, please. Usopp handed it over, and, at Ace's request, two simple lead stars. Watch. Ace pulled back on the slingshot and fired. The little lead ball hit the rock he was aiming at and bounced off. It was flattened and had barely scratched the rock. While Luffy made sure to have the most unimpressed look imaginable, nice shot. He said dully, making the other crew members snigger. Smartus. Ace rolled his eyes and grabbed the second ball, let's see if you're singing the same tune after this. His arms and the slingshot itself blackened again, and he pulled back much farther than he had the last time. He stretched it to the point that Usopp was afraid he was going to snap the band, since it wasn't meant to stretch that much. But it never did. And when Usopp examined it later, he found it was just as stretchy as it had been when he upgraded it. 
and then Ace let go, and the crack of air made the ball sound like a bullet being fired. Usopp's ordinary little lead star pierced the boulder Ace was aiming at. It went completely through roughly two feet of solid rock and then caused a small little explosion of sand behind it once it hit the ground. Little bits of sand rained down before settling. Boya. Every male and some of the females on the crew were eyeing the boulder with stars in their eyes. Luffy straight up was drooling. They snorted, thought so he sings songed, Busmshoku at its weakest allows you to cover yourself and other items in your own spirit. This will enhance some attacks and allow you to bypass devil fruit abilities. It's how Gramps could always hit you and not worry about you transforming. The blackening you saw is a step up from that, allowing you to harden whatever you want with your Busmshoku. A cheap ass sword could become as strong as a regular old might. You hit a lot harder with way more power, and depending on how strong your strikes are, you can even extend their range. And like you saw, I could stretch Usopp's slingshot way farther than I should have been able to. That was because I was reinforcing the material. He grinned, so, what do you think, little brother? So cool. Most of the crew chanted back, while Robin merely smiled. He tossed the slingshot back to Usopp, there's more to Busmshoku, but that's beyond my skill with it. Pops can not only hit someone without even touching them, but he can also destroy stuff from the inside out. That's about as high as the ability will go, as far as I'm aware. Even the best swordsman would be unable to cut pure Kermsiki. But add advanced Busmshoku. Easy as butter. Zoro grinned widely, willpower, huh? He drew Wad Michimanji and pointed it at Ace, mind if I try something. Ace blinked before holding his hand out and grabbing Luffy's pipe. Two of your crew? You really are the baby, huh Luffy? Shut. Luffy glared at his older brother. Ace grinned as the pipe blackened, sure thing. Oh what's your name again? He asked after a small pause and everyone almost fell over. After playing a quick round of meet and greet, he and Zoro went down to the sands and he turned to Zoro, alright Zoro, let's see it. Zoro closed his eyes and took a few seconds to fall into the mentality he needed. Ace's eyes widened when he sensed Zoro's strength rise and saw the brief glimmer of Busmshoku. Zoro's eyes snapped open and he charged. Unlike usual, he didn't call out an attack name. It wasn't an attack that was ready and not one he'd likely use because of the setup time. He would name it once that was no longer the case. Instead, with a roar, he swung his blade down on Ace. Ace swung the pipe up from his right side, stopping the attack dead, despite the shockwave that left Zoro's blade and cut about three feet deep into the sands below. Ace grinned. His pipe was steady while Zoro's blade was straining. He flexed and flung the swordsman away. He let out a loud bark of laughter, ha. Huh? Where did you find these guys, Luffy? He laughed long and hard, that's some will you've got, Zoro. What's your dream? Zoro sheathed Wadden to stand at the top as the world's greatest swordsman. Ace's smile nearly split his face, birds of a feather. He grinned at Luffy, looks like your crew is as crazy as you are. He then ruined the moment by sticking his tongue out, and that's two out of three, Lou. You've only got one more shot, otherwise the other members of your crew will get to all three types of hockey before you. Ahahaha. <laughs> There's a third Luffy ignored the teasing, shaking his brother in excitement, what is it, what is it? Idiot. Stop shaking me. He flicked Luffy on the nose, anyway, I won't bother showing it to you guys, because it's one of those one in a million type of things. Anyone can learn the other two types of hockey. The last is special. You have to be born with it, and it's called Hamshoku. Essentially, you put your spirit against your opponent. He explained, and depending on how superior your will is to your enemies you can knock them unconscious without lifting a finger. Luffy inhaled sharply, oh or kill them outright via heart attacks. He came to the abrupt realization due to Ace's explanation. His crewmates paled. What? Ace blinked, staring at his younger brother in shock, what is that supposed to mean? How do you know something like that? Shanks. Luffy said, looking out towards the sea, the bandits. Remember? I told you about them before. That jogged Ace's memory, and he let out a shudder, holy how powerful is Shanks. I've never seen Hamshoku do that even to weaklings. Luffy started to snicker, well, he was pretty mad. He clenched his fist, so that's the level I've got to reach, huh? They snorted, not even a lick of concern. That's just like you, Luffy. He shook his head, anyway, I will say this about Hamshoku. Once you unleash the ability, you can't bottle that genie back up. Intense emotions can and will let the ability leak out, even after you've gotten a handle on controlling it. So before you get tough at point. There was a dark glint in Ace's eyes, hope the people around you have the will to survive it. That certainly chilled some of the crew. The warning delivered, Ace was back to his assigoing manner. Anyway, if you ever want to join me on Pop's ship, the invite is open. He ruffled Luffy's hair before Luffy shrugged his arm off with a small glare, as for hockey training for Busmshoku is straightforward. It's not too different from Tekai training. 
dust beat the hell out of each other while thinking there's no wall I can't bring down or there's no strike which can reach me that kind of stuff. Though I have to warn you, and this is true no matter which type you're going for, no matter how much training you put into it, hockey always grows the fastest when you're at risk. Power only truly blossoms when you overcome great danger. There were the groans he was expecting to see. Damn it. Nami yelled out, shaking her fist impotently, I don't want to be a mass of bruises before I get it working. VV and Valerie were nodding in tandem. Robin was the odd duck out. Ace laughed, you should know by now there's no easy path to strength. He grinned evilly at them, so in a few words suck it up. Ahahaha. The three women glowered at him before he surprised them by saying his goodbyes, anyway, I've been here too long. Need to try to get back on Teach's trail. What? Luffy gasped, you're leaving already? At least stay to have some food. Sanji's food is the best. Not all of us have bottomless pits for stomachs like you. Ace deadpanned, smirking lightly, so I'll have to take a rain check on that meal. He grinned at the rest of them, take care of him. Kid brother like him makes an older brother worry. He held out his hand and gave Luffy a folded up piece of paper. Eh? Luffy blinked, the heck is this? Would you give me a blank sheet of paper? He opened it up and saw nothing was written on either side. It's a Viver card. Ace chuckled at the fact that not even Robin apparently knew what that was, hold it out flat on your hand. Luffy did so, and they all gaped as the paper spun freely in his hand as Ace walked a circle around him. The paper pointed unerringly to the 900 million Beely man. Keep that safe, will ya? Ace grinned, as you can see, that paper will allow you to find me again. He tipped his hat, next time we meet, it'll be on the high seas. With that, he turned and jumped off, landing on a small, strange-looking boat. Fire started spewing from the back and it shot forward, before it turned, and Ace directed it out to open sea. Luffy smirked as what few Baroque Works billion ships they probably had left, or maybe some idiot millions looking for a promotion, got in his brother's way. Ace leapt up, sending his boat under the ships. They all heard the shout of Hyken. As a massive fist made from bright flames erupted in front of him, driving through every vessel and sinking them in a single blow. So cool. Several of the crew stared out at Luffy's vanishing brother on the horizon. Nami smirked, well, he's certainly your brother. She grinned, pecking Luffy on the cheek. Luffy smiled, before turning to the crew and putting his game face on, we ready? Yes captain. The crew shouted. Luffy grinned, before pushing down on his hat and tilting his head down, so that the only bit of his face that was visible was his shadowed, massive grin, let's go skin us a crocodile. Weeks prior. Normally when pirates decided to get uppity in Alabasta, Sir Crocodile would casually defeat them with the greatest of ease. He would play up his role of Alabasta's great hero, their guardian deity. He would appear in the midst of the pirates, cocky smirk on his face, collected confidence not merely bordering on arrogance suffusing his voice. He would even playfully chide the populace, letting their adulation wash over him. The day he did not smirk. He did not banter. He did not play. He didn't even enjoy the misplaced adulation of the people. As he flowed into the air above Nanahana, he took the barest of seconds to locate the captain before he allowed himself to fall from the sky. The obese and smelly man didn't know what hit him. Crocodile hit him from above with the force of a small meteor, crushing him utterly into the sands below. The impact even blew the closest of the pirate's men over. Screams from the civilians rang out in fright before the dust cleared, revealing a desiccated husk of a man underneath Crocodile's hand. As the civilians cheered his arrival, he did not grandstand. He merely looked up, revealing a face visibly trying to hold in sheer bloody rage. His eyes were wider than normal and engulfed with red veins. His jaw was clenched holding in his cigar. Even a vein was lightly pulsing on his forehead. The cheering died in shock as the pirates tried to get a hold of themselves. Crocodile didn't let them. Didn't give them a moment to breathe. Didn't even let them finish a single word. Sand whipped out, grabbing every single one of the pirates in violent chokeholds. He ripped them away from the civilians they were threatening, grinding their steel into metal dust and engulfing them in billowing clouds of sand. Their screams of agony were silenced as they all compacted into a ball of sand above his head, accompanied by the loud sounds of snapping bones and tearing skin. But despite stripping the flesh from their bones, not a drop of blood leaked down on the heads of the people he'd saved. But nary a thought, the ball crushed in on itself and compacted before it was flung far outside the outskirts of Nanahana. It impacted the desert and spewed sand everywhere, revealing the utterly annihilated pirate crew, dead, broken, and mummified. Sir Crocodile took another deep drag of his cigar, turning half of it into ash immediately. His twelfth of the day, and it was barely past noon. He huffed the smoke through his nose like a dragon, allowing the burn to take a tiny bit of the edge off. It did barely more than this distraction had to calm him. See Crocodile Sama. He looked down at the tiny girl looking up at him, eyes everything okay. You seem angry. This wouldn't do. 
he couldn't afford to have the people lose trust in him. He forced a smile onto his face as he reached down to pat her head, I'm sorry for scaring you, young one. He was quite good at faking a sincere tone, wasn't he? I'm afraid I've lost contact with one of my friends. There had been the barest hint of a delay on the word. Like he had to force it out of his mouth, she was quite important to me, so I've been very worried. And just like that, the tension was diffused, don't worry. If she was friends with you, I'm sure she's strong too. She'll turn up. The girl beamed at him, and he laughed. Yes, you're right, young one. As he rose into the air and waved his goodbye, his smile vanished, or you damn well better be. But the girl had not been right. Days had turned to weeks, and now more than a month had passed since the last time Nico Robin had contacted him. Last he'd heard from her, she had been taking a leisurely pit stop on an island on her way to Whiskey Peak. He didn't know why he ever put up with her whims. Especially when she was so. Damn. Vital. To his plans. No, forget vital. Nico Robin was the most important cog in his entire organization. No matter what he did, he could not find Pluton if he couldn't read that fucking poneglyph. He reached up and started to rub the bridge of his nose in stress. He knew there were other options, but Nico Robin had oh so conveniently fallen into his lap. Three I tribe members were rare enough that even that fucking fat hag in the New World had only managed to find a single one with all her resources. And she had failed to get more than a single child from them. He slapped a hand on his desk with a growl and cursed as part of it turned to sand beneath his hand. His rage was growing out of control and all because of that fucking crew of newbies from the East fucking Blue. That damn crew that had picked up Princess VV was much more dangerous than he had ever expected. Not only did they kill Mr. Five, but they killed the unluckies as well. This Valentine was also gone and probably dead. Mr. Three had also gone dark and he assumed that meant he was dead too, along with the pint-sized artist Brad. Six reliable agents with good track records, all taken out by rookies. And he feared what had become of Miss All Sunday because he knew one of three things had happened. The best case scenario was that she had been captured. Perhaps the princess had convinced them to torture information about Baroque works out of her. It would be an irritation and would require him to change plans to keep ahead of them, but it would still work out in his favor. It was admittedly wishful thinking, if not for the fact that she was objectively a beautiful woman. Once they had gotten whatever info they needed out of her, there would be no reason to keep her around unless they were particularly beholden to their baser instincts. Perhaps the captain had decided to keep her as his plaything. It was certainly the scenario he was hoping for. He cared not for her mental state when he recovered her, only her ability to read. The worst case scenario was that they had killed her. The captain had shown no mercy to Mr. Five. His bloodied corpse had been recovered by the millions, with every bone in his body shattered. The unluckies had washed up on shore with chunks missing from their bones due to the surrounding sea life, and whatever portraits they had created were waterlogged and useless. All he had were the bounties. Valentine had gone missing entirely, and Mr. Three and Miss Gildenweek had simply fallen off the face of the earth. He didn't know what that damned princess had offered the Straw Hats to be her protectors, but clearly, it must have been an offer they couldn't refuse. He didn't even bother contemplating the idea of betrayal. Such a scenario was so hilariously unlikely as to be a complete non-starter. Nico Robin was obsessed with the Poneglyphs and would never betray that goal. Not to mention she damn well knew exactly what fate awaited her if she even considered betrayal. But whatever scenario was the real one, the fact remained that she was gone and there were zero signs of her. Clearly, it was time to face the facts. He was going to have to alter several plans and take up some grunt work of his own. Finishing his cigar, he flicked it into a bin and pulled out a fresh one. He clipped the end off and lit it up and took another deep drag. This situation had him so stressed out he was going to burn through his entire damned supply. He'd have to make sure to order more immediately. After all he mused as he pulled out his very afraid looking den den mushy, one salubarna is ashes, I'll have to find a new brand. Stop joking I ruined. Mr. Two predictably couldn't keep still even if you paid him to. How long are they going to make us wait? To be fair, he had a point. They'd been waiting for quite a while already. They could at least bring out some octopars. The ballerina stood and started to spin, I'm going to spin. When I spin, I look like a swan. Quiet, fool. Your jabber makes my back hurt. Miss Merry Christmas narked as she rapidly tapped on the table. Miss Doublefinger let out a sigh, calm down, Mr. Two Bone Clay. You too Miss Merry Christmas. Mr. One had been silent thus far, but after a few more minutes even he had reached the end of his patience. He had slowly grown more and more irritated by the inane babble and yelling, and finally he spoke, silence. His voice cracked like a whip, even jarring Mr. Two of his excitement. Mr. Two has a point. How long do they intend to keep us waiting? Even Miss All Sunday isn't here. She's normally quite punctual with meetings. Miss All Sunday didn't set this up. Miss Doublefinger said, drawing their attention. 
What? Mr. Two yelled not miss all Sunday. But she handles all deployments. Miss Doublefinger nodded, that's right it was the boss himself who set up this meeting. Interesting. Mr. One said, closing his eyes once more, why the change? Because Miss All Sunday is not here. Their eyes all popped open in shock as they snapped their gazes to the chair at the head of the table. It was turned away from them, but they had paid it no mind, assuming it was a symbolic gesture based on no one knowing the boss's identity. Miss All Sunday has gone missing, and so we will have to proceed without her. Missing Miss Doublefinger gasped, how is that possible? She was one of the strongest. Stop joking I ruined. Mr. Two yelled, who are you? And where are we, for that matter? Miss Merry Christmas yelled as well. This is why I don't deal with them. At least one and Doublefinger aren't annoying. Crocodile thought to himself, as to where you are. You've all heard of this place. Perhaps even tried to get rich quick at the gaming tables. We're in Rainbase. The city of dreams, and specifically underneath Rain Dinners, the biggest casino in the country. He smirked, and as to who I am he swung his chair around, somehow not making a sound, I suppose my face will suffice. Even Mr. One couldn't keep a shock off his face, Sir Crocodile, most of them yelled out. Booey, that's some VIP that just showed up. Miss Merry Christmas dapped at her face with a napkin. Don't tell me we're a pirate's henchman. Mr. Two had a look that was half shock, half disappointment on his face. Maybe some anger thrown in too. Forget just a regular pirate. He's one of the Shichibukai. Miss Doublefinger swallowed her shock. So, you're our boss, huh? The calm and collected look returned to Mr. One's face. Disappointed. Crocodile gave them a flat look. The feeling of doom spread through them quickly, and Miss Doublefinger raced to dispel it, not the word I'd use. She crossed her arms, confused would be better. Why would one of the government's allies create an organization like this? I will inform you of that in a little while. Crocodile scowled, first, we must deal with the elephant in the room. His glare sharpened, or rather, the elephant not in the room. Miss All Sunday. He lit yet another cigar, weeks ago, a rather unusual crew entered the Grand Line from the East Blue. What we know of as the weakest of the seas, somehow birthed a crew where three members collectively earned a hundred million Beely bounty, with the captain taking half of it on his own. That got eyebrow raises from the more collected members of the crew, and outright jaw drops from the more excitable members. Crocodile reached into his fur coat and drew the three bounties in question, throwing them on the desk. The crew picked up Miss Wednesday, who ended up being a disguised Princess Nefertari VV. I do not know what that brat offered them, but they have been her protectors since. He slightly crushed his cigar with his teeth, since picking her up, they have defeated the Mr. Five pair, the Mr. Three pair, the unluckies, and to the best of my knowledge, even Miss All Sunday herself. Holy hell, that's impossible. Miss Doublefinger couldn't contain her shock. Mr. Two didn't even try, stop joking a ruined. A bunch of rookies have taken out six of our most important members. Indeed. Crocodile glared at them so they would shut up, and the worst part is, only Mr. Five and the unluckies are confirmed dead. I don't doubt that fate befell most of them, but if they were smart, they would have taken prisoners too. As such, we are going to have to push up our timetable and alter several missions. Despite these setbacks, we will not let ourselves be distracted from our ultimate goal. It is time that you learn of the ultimate goal of Baroque works. Mr. Two was sparkling, such a thing actually exists in this kingdom, and we're going to take it away, kingdom and all this is so exciting. HMPH. So that's why you focused our efforts on this backwater. Mr. One smirked, a worthy goal. That's right. Since Baroque Works inception, everything we've done has been in preparation for this. He handed a set of stacked papers to Miss Doublefinger, who took the top one and passed the stack to her partner, and so on. Those are my final instructions to you. A confident smirk rose on his face, the time has come for Alabasta to disappear. All of them took a few minutes to read through the details and memorize them. Once finished, all of them reached for the candles on the table and burned them, when your individual missions have been carried out, the kingdom of Alabasta will self-destruct. With nowhere to go, the rebels and citizens will inevitably fall under the control of Baroque works. In a single night, this kingdom will become our utopia. Failure is not an option. Right. Then I pray for your success. Crocodile looked each of them in the eye, and that feeling of doom returned, no more mistakes. All of them, seasoned assassins and saboteurs alike, couldn't help but swallow nervously. The going Mary sailed with purpose, heading away from Nanahana towards Aramalu. Formerly the city of Green. Nami had just sewn up Ace's beaver card into Luffy's hat, so now they were going through other preparations. Here Luffy, wear this. Vivi handed him a set of clothes. What for? Luffy asked cluelessly, accepting them anyway. All of us have to cover up. Vivi explained, yes, Sanji, that means us too. She rolled her eyes as Sanji predictably freaked out over it, before Robin took over. 
in the desert, it can hit over 120 degrees during the day. The dark-haired woman said, why, in the right conditions, you can even spontaneously combust out here. Like an ant under a magnifying glass. She even giggled as she said so. Several of the other crew members turned slightly blue at the sound. Oh. Luffy said, before handing the clothes back to VV, don't need them. Save them for someone who does. Eh? They all blinked at his reaction. I'm the sun, remember? Luffy laughed at their reactions. I feel dumb now. VV groused, if you could wear shorts in a blizzard, why couldn't you wear them in a desert? She rubbed her chin, although, now that I think about it, if we run into any sandstorms you'll still want to be covered up. She smirked up at him, unless you want to try eating sand, of course. Luffy wrinkled his nose, fine. Just a cloak then. He blinked, huh, maybe I should get a captain's cloak. Hey, did we hit the edge of the island? Usopp called out, I thought we were going inland. We did not. Valerie giggled, this is actually just the edge of the Sandora River. If you look farther you can see the other bank. Wow, it's such a big river. Chopper had stars in his eyes. Nothing like this existed back on Drum Island. And now that his nose wasn't being murdered by perfumes, he could actually take it in. It's been years since I've seen it. VV said quietly, a small smile on her face, but that's beside the point. She unfurled the map they had acquired, we were just here. She pointed to the port city they'd landed in, and our targets are here, she pointed to Rain Base, and here. She pointed to the capital city, and that means we're going to sail up the river to avoid having to travel through the desert the entire time. Nami remembered their planning sessions and discussions prior to even sniffing Alabasta's shores, so first, we stop at Aramalu, correct? That's right. Robin confirmed, frankly, I wanted to hit the spider cafe before anything else, but if our guess is right, then that area is empty now. Sir Crocodile is, unfortunately, a rather paranoid and intelligent individual, so if there's even a slight chance that he believes I betrayed him, then he would act upon it. It's what I would do. She admitted, or at least the first of many things I would do in his place. Right, and we can't assume he doesn't know who we are, even if he doesn't know who all of us are. Valerie picked up from where Robin dropped off. We don't even know whether or not any of us were recognized over in Nanahana. If Robin was recognized by one of the millions or billions, then we might be in trouble. Which is why we're going to disguise Mary. Sanji rolled his cigarette between his lips, they'll be expecting a rather memorable little caravel, not an average one. Well, that and we're going to need to leave her unattended. Usopp spun a hammer, so let's get to it. They made speedy progress towards Aramalu, with Robin scouting using her powers. Luckily, it seemed that the ruined city wasn't being watched at all. They managed to weigh anchor easily enough and immediately set out on their tasks. Luffy hopped on Mary's figurehead and patted her head, sorry Mary, it'll only be for a short while, okay. The figurehead had a sad but understanding look on her face. They had never quite gotten over how their ship could be so expressive, but it just made them love her even more. Using Robin's devil fruit, they quickly took down the sails and the pirate flag, replacing them with fresh canvas. The red and white striped lateen sail was also exchanged for a more toned down version. Mary's figurehead was also covered up, with them making it look like a natural log was there. It was just a facade though. Anyone that looked closely would figure out that it was a fake. By the end of their work, Mary had been transformed into what looked like a simple merchant ship. Robin kept a weather eye in all directions, but nothing came near. She did relay that the marines had sailed upriver after a couple hours, drawing groans from even Luffy. It was going to be so annoying if they got in the way while they were busy saving VV's country. Of course, it wasn't all smooth work. Near the time they had arrived, animals called Kung Fu Dugongs had risen from the banks of the river. They were dugongs with turtle shells. Quite interesting little mammals. Wait, kung fu. Like this. Vivi stiffened and whirled around, no Usopp. They take that as a she watched as the dugong attacked, and Usopp used Soru to get behind it, challenge. She trailed off lamely. Amiwamo, Shinderu. Usopp's face was shadowed, and the dugong let out a strange noise of shock. He whirled around to punch it, but the dugong smirked and flipped over him, and tried to tail slap him away with an animalistic cry. They two faced each other and began exchanging fists with serious looks on their faces. Hi ha ha ha. Valerie was cackling, ooh ho. Oh. My ribs. I'm not the only one who heard, I know you are, but what am I? Right. Robin was giggling into her hand as well as she watched their sniper go hand to hand with a dugong. Nami's eye twitched before she vanished. Twin punches crashed into the heads of both fighters, sending them to the ground with grunts of pain, cool your heads. She yelled, having to shake her fist off from the impact with the shell, before pointing at Usopp, we're on a time crunch here. She turned to the dugong, and yo you. She looked at the dugong bound to her, what? Vivi slapped herself in the face, damn it. 
Robin was grinning, what our little forgetful princess VV sagged even further, forgot to mention is that it is the code of the Kung Fu Dugong to become the disciple of anyone who defeats it. Nami stared at it and then jumped a little as more and more Dugongs flipped out of the river and communicated with the one she hit before they all started bowing to her. You gotta be shitting me. She glared at Robin and Valerie, VV's one thing. Hey. She snorted at the princess's indignant yelp, crocodile. VV raised a finger and opened her mouth before curling the finger down, withdrawn. That's what I thought. Nami smirked before turning back to Robin, but why exactly did you not warn us? Uf 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 Robin continued to laugh and rob myself of this fun. Nami's facipum was loud and audible. She tilted her head and tapped her chin with a finger, plus, they could be useful in defending the ship. She mentioned, almost as an afterthought. Huh, this played out nicely. Zoro snarked, looking almost disappointed that none of them seemed to carry weapons. Nami counted to ten and turned to her new disciples, all right, listen up. She barked at them. Arf. The dugong saluted her, drawing a smirk. Yes, this could work nicely. She mused, first, we're going to sail upriver in a few hours and are going to need to leave our ship unattended. Someone is going to need to defend her. That'll be your job, got it? Arf. The dugongs all barked back, raising fists. And second Nami grinned before pointing at Luffy, I'm his disciple, so go train with him. Eh? Luffy blinked, don't you need me to help with the ship? Nah, have fun. We've got this. Nami waved at him as she walked back. Luffy grinned before vanishing and reappearing in front of the dugongs. All the little mammals were starry-eyed as they stared at him and his sheer speed, alright guys. By the time we leave Alabasta, I want at least one of you to be able to do this. He raised his leg and sliced it down. A wind blade erupted and carved the ocean right down to the other bank a few hundred feet away. He didn't go farther than that because that would be a bit too attention-grabbing. The dugongs started barking hysterically in sheer awe. That's impossible. VV and Valerie deadpanned. They don't have legs. Zori uses his sword. Usopp looked a little grouchy from the lump on his head. Topper nodded, they could use a flipper. Or maybe a blunt version with their tails. No, still impossible. Valerie crossed her arms in an X in front of her chest, it took Nami weeks before she even got a whisper of it. None of the rest of us have it yet. I think that's the point. Robin commented, he's giving them an impossible task to reach for. Possibly so they don't try to follow us when we leave. She stretched, regardless, we have work to do. Let's get to it. Right. In just a few short hours, they had finished disguising Mary and had set sail for Maramalu upriver. The dugongs were following beneath them and keeping a close eye on things from underwater. Of course, it was rather poor luck that they hadn't taken another hour or so to finish the work, and perhaps even poor luck that they hadn't simply arrived around half a day later than they did. If they had, there was a very good chance that VV might actually have been able to catch Baroque works directly in the act and proven her father's innocence. As it was. They were just too far away when about an hour after their departure, black smoke started to rise in the horizon aft of the ship. Hours later, the ship was nearing the point where they planned on splitting up. While they would love to stay together as a unit, with so many unknowns and with the threat of Mr. Two, the smarter play was to try to attack on two fronts. VV finished tying the bandage on her arm with a smile, are we all ready? She asked, before thrusting her fist out and showing her arm. The rest of them all smiled, you know it. They all matched her, forming a circle of arms, each covered in a bandage. With this, we'll be able to tell if this Mr. Two is trying to mess with us. Usopp said. It was a good plan. Robin nodded approvingly, glad she hadn't needed to mention it herself. We're here. Nami said, pointing at the bank to port. We'll see you all when this is over, yeah? Right. Stay safe. Zoro commanded, before leaping off the ship and using Gepin to cross the distance to the bank. Nami grabbed Luffy and gave him a kiss, much to Sanji's anguish. Kick his ass. She breathed in his ear with a hug. And then VV shocked them all when she did the same. Why it? Sanji turned into glass and shattered into a million pieces. Uf 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 Robin could only giggle while the rest of the crew picked up their jaws, ara ara, it appears our little navigator wasn't kidding back before we landed on Little Garden. VV's face was red, give him hell. She commanded, at her most queenly. Luffy cracked his knuckles with a confident smirk, I'm planning on it. Shall we, then? Robin asked, sidling up to him with a smile. She laughed as Sanji practically combusted when Luffy picked her up in a bridal carry. Unfortunately, she didn't get to see more of that reaction, because then the world blurred as they vanished from the Mary's deck. Said reaction was Sanji gnawing on a piece of cloth, shitty stupid straw hat. Nami walked by, and Dope slapped him in the back of the head, head in the game, Sanji kun. She smirked, you can whine about Luffy having better game than you when this is over. What? 
Sanji whirled into action, helping them maneuver the ship easily as he ranted, I have more game in my little toe than that shitty straw hat has in his body. Ay ha 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 ha. Valentine laughed as she soared to the crow's nest, evidence to the contrary notwithstanding. Usopp cackled, yeah, it's not like he's up to to zero or anything. Now Sanji did actually combust, and the words he said sounded like no human tongue ever could. Vivi rolled her eyes, come on. We need to leave the ship somewhere safe. We need to meet with Karu. Won't the poor thing be exhausted? Nami frowned, I know he agreed to do it, but to run all the way to Alubarna and then meet with us. He can do it. Vivi confirmed, a hard set smile on her face, Karu belongs here in the desert. After we left, I was constantly having to take care of him and had to watch helplessly as he lost his strength. He had only barely stopped getting sick a few months before we met you. She sighed, his species was born, raised, and evolved here in the desert. The humidity and cooler climate in the outside world wreaked havoc on him. Her smile definitely had a bit of a bitter edge, I should never have taken him with me. Just a few minutes in Nanahana had him looking healthier than I've seen him in years. Wow, the poor duck. Chopper gasped, why didn't you say anything? I could have looked him over. BV winced, like I said, he had at least stopped getting sick recently. It had been several months actually, so he seemed to be a lot better. Plus, we were already on our way back here. I was hoping he'd be like a regular duck to water. Topper shook his head, okay. I'll need to examine him anyway. At least for long-term issues. BV flinched, you don't think there will be, do you? Can't say. Chopper responded, but at least he showed an improvement. An improvement is better than any further illness. I can only think of a few diseases he could catch, and thankfully all of them should be mitigatable at worst. He gave her a hoof up, I'll make sure he's as strong as an ox. Thank you, Tony Kun. VV gave the zone a hug. Baka. That doesn't make me happy. He wiggled in her arms. They had sailed up one of the smaller tributaries. It looked like it was drying up, so Nami had to use every ounce of her skills to get Mary to a safe location. The dugongs had already posted up, and now they were ready to head to Alubarna. Look. Valerie called out from the air, pointing to an approaching dust cloud. VV smiled in relief, he did it. The dust cloud approached, revealing the super spot Bill duck troops. Each of the giant ducks slowed to a halt in front of them, before saluting VV. Karu. She launched herself at her pet and hugged him, oh, you must be exhausted. Karu looked dirty, but was putting on a brave face. Would you like to rest on the Mary? Quack. Karu shook his head roughly. He was exhausted, but he would see VV safe. Well, you definitely need some water and a few minutes to rest before we get moving again. VV said, waving all of the ducks over to the Mary, did anyone see you? She asked Karu. Quack, quack. Karu had followed instructions perfectly. He'd snuck in via path Robin had informed them of. A secret entrance created by Miss Merry Christmas for Baroque Works purposes. After doing so, he'd gone directly to the Super Spot Bill Duck Troop's barracks and gotten some much needed water and a few minutes of rest before they all blazed out of the city. No one had realized he was there and hopefully, no one paid attention to the missing ducks. After the ducks had some much needed water and a light snack, they were finally ready to go. Okay. Nami declared, onto Alubarna. First priority is disabling that damn bomb, and that means we need to find it. She clenched her fist, we also need to try to either get to VV's father or have VV herself take control of the army so we can start rooting out Baroque works. This won't end if any of those jackasses just start shooting. Sanji's eye gleamed, and if any of the officer agents are there, leave them to us. He looked forward to letting loose some of his frustration over their shitty captain, now dating two of the wonderful ladies on their crew. I call grandma bitch. Valerie said enthusiastically, insult my chocolate, will she? The blonde burned in eagerness. We all know our roles. VV yelled as she mounted Karu, let's go. And how, Robin's eyebrow, which lightly, did you get here? She asked Zoro. Eh? He turned around, oh, there you guys are. What did you go and get lost for? Luffy snickered into his fist as forearms grew out of Zoro's shoulders and dope slapped him in sequence. Ow oh, damn it. Zoro cursed, what the hell was that for? Robin's tone was rather incensed, we were traveling. She said like she was talking to a pet, in a straight line. She said with as much patience as she could muster, so how did you utterly vanish less than a mile from the coast and still somehow beat us here? HRMPH, the dunes were confusing. He did not actually answer the question, stupid moving landscape. Robin shook her head and let out a sigh, well, let's get a move on then. At least try to not get lost this time, Zoro. Who the hell would get lost here? Zoro asked before walking to the right. Robin's eye twitched as she grew an arm from the wall to dope slap him again and point to her and Luffy. GRK. Zoro walked over to them. Who indeed? Robin asked dryly, already exasperated. 
The sun had just set, and the light was dimming, so it was quite easy to sneak into the prosperous city. Honestly, color me impressed. I expected this to be a lot louder. Robin chuckled to herself. This sure brings memories back. Luffy grinned, doing almost a better job of sneaking than Robin herself was doing. Ace and I did this all the time in the Goat Kingdom when we wanted to rob that jackass noble blind. Ah. Several things make much more sense now. Robin said lightly, before her face locked up and she held an arm out, stopping Luffy and Zoro. Marines. She said, whispering now. Luffy and Zoro looked, smoky. He groaned, he couldn't find a clue if it was in front of him, could he? She's here too. Zoro grumbled, looking at Toshigi. Smoker San isn't the only problem. Robin said, the pink-haired one. That's Black Cage Hina. Why is she here too? Looks like they're pulling out all the stops for us. Zoro commented, can we avoid them? Easily. Follow me. Robin replied, and before they knew it, they were far away from the marine patrols. She took her eyes off Luffy and Zoro for just a second, but when she looked again, Luffy was happily munching on a bunch of snacks, and Zoro was sipping at some sake. She blinked in shock and then made eyes to follow them at all times. I thought we needed to head for the casino. Aren't we moving away from that shit croc? Zoro pointed to the giant golden figurehead in the distance. Robin smirked and poked a brick in the wall she had led them to. The brick depressed and swung like it was on a hinge. There was a slight click and then the entire wall swung open, revealing a hidden door, are we? Whoa. So cool. Luffy had stars in his eyes and Zoro himself was looking impressed. Not bad. He smirked as they walked inside. The tunnel continued for several hundred feet through various hallways and forks in the road. Robin had eyes scouting ahead for traps, but found nothing. We're here. She said quietly, remember, the casino is above us and it's bound to be full at this hour. Let's try not to blow the place up. Gotcha. Luffy said, let's end this. Robin nodded as Zoro fingered his blade. She pushed the door open silently as she drew a blade that was already wet with water and they rushed inside. Only the room was empty. Plus, there was a giant screen in the middle of the room she didn't remember being there. What? Robin asked the empty air, it wasn't tea, she seemed to realize something, leave. She said urgently, now. She turned back to the way they came, but it was too late. With loud clangs, the hidden door swung shut and bars came down over it, along with every single other entrance into the room. Luffy reached the door and tried to wrench the bars away, but was immediately overcome by a sense of exhaustion and almost slumped to the floor, what the? Sea stone. Robin hissed, whirling towards the screen as a pedestal rose from the floor, revealing a den den mushy with large eyes and eyelashes. It started projecting, and Crocodile was revealed to the crew at last. He glared at Robin with pure fury hidden in his eyes, congratulations. He said thinly, it's not often that I'm caught by surprise. I calculated many different possibilities for your absence, Miss All Sunday. He bit through his cigar, but not once did I consider betrayal. He spat the butt of his cigar out. So, tell me what did they offer? If someone could die from being glared at, Robin would be ashes at the moment, what convinced you to betray me? Robin stared at him, before snorting, betray. I've done no such thing. She leered at him, our partnership was always one of convenience, Sir Crocodile. And we both know you planned on killing me the moment you got what you wanted. Could hardly have me getting cold feet and telling anyone else about where Pluton was, could we? She smirked as the barb hit home, as evidenced by his clenching jaw. So I suppose this means you never planned on telling me where it was in the first place. He managed to hiss out. The only thing I planned to tell you was goodbye. She said, spinning her knife in her hand, after I plunged this into your heart, of course. Luffy could contain himself no longer, oi. He stepped forward, stop hiding behind your dumb screen and come out and fight me. Crocodile's gaze turned to Luffy's, and for the first time during their conversation, he smirked, so, your straw hat Luffy, huh? You don't look like much, but you did well getting this far. I'd love to kill you personally, but unfortunately, that would be rather difficult. After all his smirk widened as he stuck another cigar between his teeth, I'm not in Rainbase right now. What? All three pirates gasped with varying degrees of volume. Crocodile's grin was so smug and massive that his cheeks were almost tearing, as if I would compromise my three-year-long plan to have a slugfist with some no-name pirate captain from East Blue. Luffy and Zoro started to gnash their teeth as Crocodile looked at Robin, and as for you, you were a useful tool. It would have taken much longer to get here without your help. Unfortunately, your time is at an end. And as for the Poneglyph. Well, seeing as your information would have been useless, I'll just have to acquire alternative means of reading it. But the word, several geysers seemed to open up through the room, and several vents on the ceiling blew out. Water started spewing with all the fury of the oceans themselves, despite just coming from the lake up above, goodbye miss all Sunday. And goodbye, you pirate morons. Don't you worry. 
I'll take good care of your little princess. And before the straw hats could say a word, the screen went dark. They had made good time, even if their approach was rather obvious. The super spot build duck troops may have been the fastest in Alabasta, but the huge sand cloud they were kicking up was certainly attention grabbing. Karu by himself had been able to sneak in, but he had always been the softest of the runners. The others weren't nearly so nimble. The guards posted at the great stairs immediately called for backup, thinking that this was a surprise attack by the rebel army. Soon though, it became clear it was too small and obvious to be an attack, but the call was not cancelled. Halt. The leader of the guards called out as they approached, gripping his spear tightly. Who goes there? Sanji was the one who stepped forward, we're just weary travelers, my good man, looking to escape this cold inside the city. Ha! The guards sneered at him, weary travelers don't have access to spot build ducks, and especially not super ones like that. Nami stepped forward next, please sir, we are she put on a friendly smile as she tried to approach, and stopped short when the guards on the stairs themselves raised their guns threateningly. And furthermore the second of the guards at the foot of the steps declared, access into and out of the city is currently forbidden. Enough of this. Vivi ground her teeth. They had tried to be stealthy and avoid confrontation, but clearly, the world had other plans. They really should have tried to continue on foot so they could use that hidden entrance. She whipped the hood off her head and revealed herself, I am Princess Nefertari Vivi. Take me to my father. She was prepared for anything, including Baroque Works plants trying to fire at them. She was not prepared for what actually happened, it's the impostor. Capture her. Kill the rest. The second the third word had been spoken, Usopp had already made his move. His slingshot had whipped out of his cloak. Before the men could even finish raising their guns, Usopp had drawn his weapon and fired. Five of the guards went down instantly, and Nami, Vivi, and Sanji all vanished in bursts of sorrow. Sanji's foot broke through one of the guard spears and plowed straight into his armor, driving the man into the stone wall surrounding the steps. Vivi had been slower, but she had her peacock slashers out. The shaft of the spear he tried to thrust at her in a cross check to knock her out got cut straight in half. She stopped the spin and grabbed his wrist, dragging him forward and into her elbow, knocking the wind out of him. She then turned and judo flipped him down the steps, where Valerie stomped on him, knocking him out. Hiahaha. Well, this went about as I expected. She vanished, appearing before a guard at the top of the steps, moving even faster than Sanji had due to her extremely low mass. She was also brandishing her new umbrella. It was a much sturdier looking thing compared to her old one. The shaft was much thicker and appeared reinforced, while the tip seemed to be plated in some sort of metal. The actual fabric looked much sturdier too, and obviously was embossed with her favorite lemons. And most importantly, despite the fact that it currently weighed a thousand pounds, it was being held like a rapier. With a bit of a slasher smile on her face, she jabbed a guard in the chestplate, and the man vanished from the impact with an agonized hack. He careened into a set of approaching guards and knocked all of them down and out like a set of bowling pins. Kayahaha. How did you like my new umbrella? I weighed it down just for you. Vivi flashed by her side with a sigh, please don't kill them Val. No promises. She replied silkily. Save it for Baroque works. Damn that Mr. Two. Nami said, somewhat irritably. She would have continued, but one of the guards hadn't quite been knocked out and he managed to get his hand on a rope and immediately slumped. His weight rang the warning bell, making them jerk in shock as they turned and looked at him. The clamor rose up, and Nami cursed, we're going to have the whole damn army on our heads. Sanji Kun. Launch me and Vivi away towards the rooftops, and then all of you make nuisances of yourselves. Get their attention. You got it. Sanji called, leaping into the air. Stay safe. Nami and Vivi called out together as they hugged each other tight, and Nami leapt. They reached Sanji and grabbed his shoes before they were launched halfway across the entire city. Guards below them were racing to the entrance, and both Nami and Vivi utilized Gepn to steer themselves. Vivi much more weakly than Nami. She could only make very minor corrections or flip them so Nami could change their direction. They landed on a roof and started to lay low, come on, take the bait. Nami hissed. Back down near the stairs, Sanji landed and breathed out a puff of smoke. Well, you heard the lady. Sorry Vivi Chuan, but I'd say it's time to wreck some shit. He grinned, before jumping and landing on Chopper, who was in his full deer form and running away. The ducks all scattered as well. Looks like it's you and me again, Longnose. Kayahaha. Valerie was never going to get tired of this crew. Usopp grinned and fired off a gunpowder star. The explosive blew back some of the guards, cheese it. The two of them ran, drawing more and more guards away and causing loud explosions every time they ran into guards. What are they doing to my city? Vivi hissed in outrage as she saw the explosions. What they need to. Nami said, watching as the guards started thinning out. Let's go. 
The two of them vanished in bursts of sorrow and ran straight for the palace. We're too late, aren't we? Vivi asked her. They must have already replaced my father. Damn that Mr. Two. It was the smart move. Nami grumbled before pausing and then smirking, actually this works in our favor. All we have to do is beat that Akama's ass in public and when he falls unconscious, he should lose his transformation too. Revealing the deception. Vivi also put on her best slasher smile, let's go. They made their way to the palace, which seemed to be on high alert. Vivi carefully followed Nami's lead as they made their way up the side of the plateau, rather than taking the steps. Gep was loud, but thankfully they went unnoticed. They managed to sneak their way in, dodging guards where they could and choking them unconscious where they couldn't. Silently, they made their way to the throne room before abandoning stealth and throwing the large, heavy doors open. Unfortunately, her father wasn't there. The throne of Alabasta sat empty. But that didn't mean the room was empty. Chaka and Pal stood before them. Her protectors when she was younger and two people she really didn't want to fight. Pell. Chaka. She called out, hoping that she would be able to get them on her side. Please. I need to see my father. But their faces hardened as they drew their weapons, so, the king was right. Chaka glared at her, making her falter. He warned us that an impostor wearing his daughter's face would come. Pell stared menacingly at them, you were a fool to come here, impostor. We are well aware of your deception. Damn it. Well played, Baroque works. Nami begrudgingly mumbled out. Vivi clenched her fists, there is an impostor, but it's not me. She tried to say, but Pell cut her off. Enough words. You can speak during your interrogation. Pell rushed forward, aiming to knock her out with a solid punch. VV vanished in a burst of sorrow, appearing behind him. His eyes widened in shock as he whirled around and sprang away from her. It was a wasted effort as she had made no motion to attack him. I don't want to fight, Pell. It's me. We don't have time for this. Chaka growled and then the growling became a bit more literal as he grew in size and was engulfed in fur. Capture both of them. We'll deal with them later. He leapt at them, much faster than Pell had. Cyclone tempo. Nami called out, swinging her clean attack like a bat. Chaka grunted as the wind picked him up and flung him away from them. VV, we're not going to get anywhere like this. Take them down and let's go find Mr. Two. She vanished after Chaka. Mr. Two. Pell asked, what kind of a name is that? He transformed into his hybrid form as well. VV had always thought it was a weird one when she was younger. His arms turned into talons rather than his legs. Irk those talons would hurt much more than when he slapped me when I was younger VV mumbled. And then Pell stumbled, what? He stared at her in befuddlement, how could you possibly know that, impostor? He shook his head, enough. He sprang forward much faster than before and tried to capture her. VV dodged but had a wide grin on her face. That was it. That was how she could get them on their side. She opened her mouth but was forced to shut it again when he lashed out with a kick. GRRR, darn it, Pell. Just give me a minute. She squealed the last word as Pell blazed into the air. Oh come on. Abazoom. Pell roared, banishing from sight as he sped towards her. First, he'd knock her out and then he'd head towards the orange-haired woman and get her from behind. Chaka appeared to be struggling with her. Oh no you don't. VV saw in her mind's eye the massive bruise he was planning on leaving on her stomach and wanted no part of it. She vanished even faster than he did and planted her foot in his gut, knocking him back and out of the sky. Back. Pell had some spittle come out of his mouth as he crashed into the shining tiles of the throne room. He grunted and clenched his stomach with his talon, before glaring at her, now you've really given yourself away, impostor. Princess VV was never such a violent ruffian. The FFT. VV sputtered, clearly you and I aren't remembering things the same way, Pell. I became the second in command of the Suna Suna clan with Kumza after we beat each other up, remember. DRK. Pell's beak clenched, as for the first time, doubt started to creep in. On the other side of the throne room, Nami glared at Chaka, I really don't want to hurt you. She growled, VV told me you were a loyal soldier. You and Pal both. Hurting you would make her sad. Taka barked out a laugh, you're quite impudent, aren't you? Your words hold no meaning to me. He drew his sword, getting Nami to take a ready stance, the king himself informed us of the threat of impostors coming to take his life. I will not allow you to harm him, fool. He sprang forward, no longer aiming to just capture, but to kill if needed. Nami's gaze hardened, you're the one getting fooled. A loud clang echoed through the throne room as she parried his attack with her assembled staff and then spun it, clocking him in the head with the butt. The king is the one who's already been replaced. You're protecting the very one tricking you. The attack would have maybe even knocked out a normal man, but Chaka was his own. A carnivorous own at that. He was made of much stronger stuff. All it did was anger him, your lies will not fool me. He thundered, swiping at her first with his sword, which was dodged, and then with his claws. 
Nami grunted as she caught his swing and was almost forced to her knees from his sheer strength, fucking devil fruits. She cursed, barely managing to fling him off and getting herself ready again. Taka placed his sword in his mouth and then braced his claws, Gatska. He growled out before turning into a whirling tornado of sharp claws and sharper blade. Hami. Nami closed her eyes and let her body flow. Each attack pushed her exactly where she needed to be from the light breeze alone. Every attack, she simply dodged with what looked like no effort at all. Chaka couldn't even dice off any of her hair. What sorcery is this? Chaka growled out, his fury ratcheting higher and higher. He spat his sword into his hand and swiped at her legs, die. Nami jumped over the blade, fool. There's no escape now. He immediately changed the direction of his swing, aiming to cut her in half now that she couldn't possibly dodge. Ep. Nami called out as she jumped even higher. Taka's eyes bulged at the sight, this is impossible. He'd even overbalanced on the swing due to the target he'd fully expected to hit being missing and couldn't possibly recover. Nami had enough of talking, Renkyaku. She'd finally managed the attack on Drum Island and had trained even harder upon their return to Mary. She still wasn't anywhere near as good as Sanji but could get it consistently now. She'd done a front kick rather than a swipe. She didn't want to kill the guy, after all. A rocket of air impacted Chaka's face and sent him sprawling to the ground. He growled as he tried to get up, spitting up some blood. Sorry VV, Nami said as she spun the sections of her clean attacked, thunderbolt tempo. She assembled the staff and swung it down. Lightning screamed and Chaka spasmed as he was hit by it. When it was over, he was still spasming and had reverted to his full human form, slightly smoldering and burnt looking. D damn you he couldn't get up. His body was betraying him. He had to protect the king. Taka. Pell glared at Nami. He was panting too, though VV had only been hitting him moderately hard. He was still going to be bruised even despite his extra bulk. Stop it Pell. VV cried out, damn it, what do I have to say to get you to trust us? Don't you remember when you slapped me after I disobeyed everyone and snuck inside the armory to try to make fireworks? It was the anniversary of your enlistment and I wanted to surprise you, but I just blew myself up. She asked him, getting him to tremble at the mental assault. Don't you remember all the times you snuck me into the sky on your back even when father forbade it? I've missed doing it so much. Hell started to cry as he finally understood that she was real. Princess he turned back into his human form, I attacked you. He looked like he wanted to hurt himself for his deeds. Hell. VV crashed into him with a massive hug, it's alright. I'm not hurt. She was strong enough to make his neck creak and he didn't mind a second of it. He hugged her back before pushing her away, what is going on, VV? Well, isn't this precious? A new voice rang through the air, making them all gasp and whirl to the no longer empty throne of Alabasta. Taka, zone healing was bullshit, wasn't it? And Pell gasped out, Sir Crocodile. VV hissed hatefully, you. Get off my father's throne, you bastard. Crocodile laughed, puffing out some smoke, now, now, is that any way to speak to your boss, Miss Wednesday? What is the meaning of this? Chaka bellowed, trying to get to his feet unsteadily. VV answered, Sir Crocodile is the leader of Baroque Works. The criminal syndicate I infiltrated with Igarum to try to figure out what was causing the unrest here in Alabasta. She spat out furiously, he's been behind everything. His minions were the ones who stirred up unrest. They're the ones who created the fake shipments of dance powder to the palace in my father's name. He's the one that's been causing all of the sandstorms that have been burying all of our cities and inciting our people to violence. He's been playing us for fools ever since he stepped foot on our island. She screamed furiously, fingers clenched around her slashers. And? Crocodile smirked at them lazily, what of it? He couldn't be any smugger if he tried, it's been quite entertaining, I'll admit, watching all of you praise the guardian deity of Alabasta so much. You bastard. Pell clenched his teeth as he started to transform. VV grabbed his arm and held him back. Nami spoke for the first time, glaring at him, what happened to my crewmates? Her fingers were also clenched around the clean attack shaft, itching to knock that look off his face. Ah yes, your captain, the swordsman, and that traitorous bitch Nyko Robin. Crocodile tilted his head, well, I'm afraid I wasn't in rain dinners when they arrived, but I could hardly be a poor host. They're enjoying a long drink below the casino, as we speak. His smirk widened as Nami and Vivi went red with rage. But none of you have to worry about that. He waved a hand negligently, you'll all be too dead to do anything about it after all. Hell roared and shrugged VV's hand off, charging at him with his blade, Pell no. VV screamed at his back. Crocodile turned into sand as he dodged the attack and casually stabbed Pell in the thigh with his hook, idiot. He snorted before a wave of sand sent him crashing into Chaka, crushing them both into the floor of the throne room and even ripping up some of the rich carpets. The two groaned in their heap, shaking from the pain. 
Now, it's time for you to join your captain in death, Storm Empress. He told Nami mockingly, you shouldn't worry though, princess. He stood up from the throne and started to all but strut towards them, after all, your father has information I want and he wouldn't cough it up even under torture. He grinned wickedly as BV drew her slashers, baring her teeth at him in rage, I wonder how quickly he'll sing when it's your voice he hears screaming. The only one that's going to scream is you. Nami shot back before she and BV vanished. Thanks for watching. Hope you have a good rest of your day.